Let me read a, a, a couple of verses to you if I can get my phone to work. Here we go. I just want to read these, kind of introduce. It's found in Psalm chapter 25, verses 4 and 5. It says this, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I tell you, my heart was so blessed when I'm sitting over there and I'm just seeing the front of this place is completely loaded with people that are praying. Wasn't that something? And you know, the power of the church is in our calling upon God. And so, uh, what a, uh, and I was thinking about these verses and thinking about how when we, when we walk this path on earth, we are so tempted to think that we just have it all figured out or that we, you know, that, that somehow or another our way is it. And those verses just remind me that, you know, we just don't know as much as we think we do. And I'm going to share with you some things that you probably, you probably haven't thought of it like this, but I'm going to share it anyway. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. And this is not the first time you're going to hear that scripture. You've heard it last month. You heard it with uh, Pastor Joel. You heard it with, with uh, Tony. And now you're going to hear it with me again. But I'm going to do a little bit of a different twist. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, he says this, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is a, uh, a passage of scripture that when you read it, you would think, well, that uh, seems pretty easy. We just love God and love our neighbor and we just move on to other things. Well, Pastor Joel has preached it. Tony has touched it, and now I get to do it, which means it's not an easy subject. Okay, that means you have to have three versions of this to get the whole picture. Okay, so that's how complicated this is. So, so the trick here is to try to find a way to express this and communicate this so that we understand it and we can put it together and use it in a way that's effective. And so what I want to do is start out by giving you a cultural idea of how we view the word love. In other words, when I first thought about this, I thought of Disney's presentation of the Beauty and the Beast, right? Beauty and the Beast, the, the cartoon version, the animated version. And, and, and we think, wow, what a beautiful story, right? Okay, or Cinderella, right? We, you could, wow, what a, what a wonderful idea. Life doesn't happen like that, but it's sure wonderful to look at it, right? So that's kind of our concept of love. So let me do this. Let's start by looking at the definition of love. And by the way, this is just one of the definitions, but it's the starting point of it. So love is a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. And we would say, okay, yeah, that's pretty much the way it's presented. But what's the, uh, what's the definition of affection? Because that's in there, right? Affection is a feeling of liking or caring for someone or something. Now, I might feel a little more comfortable with that if it said a feeling of liking or caring, but it doesn't. It puts liking and caring together. So the idea is, if I care for you, then I have to like you, right? Well, what if I don't like you? And that's probably more times the case than not, okay? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm in a dilemma here because... It, it, if I base this on my feeling, I may not feel so good towards you, and therefore I may be tempted to not care for you. So let me put this definition together, okay, since they want to put affection and love together. It would be like this. Love is a strong feeling of liking and caring for someone or something. Okay, well, culturally, that's kind of the way we look at it. 
it's easy to love those who love us, right? But what do you do when it comes to loving those that don't love you, right? You distance yourself from them. You get rid of them. You avoid them, whatever it takes, right? Well, let me do this. Let's look at two verses in the Bible and ask this question. Can we apply this cultural meaning of love to these two verses. So the first one is going to be John chapter 3, verse 16. Well, we all know that one, right? For God so loved the world, right? <clears throat> well, if I apply this culture, I mean, that this means God's looking down and he sees these adorable people. Oh, look at these adorable people that oh, I just want to reach out and I want to hug them and hold them and I want to be with them, right? That's not exactly the way the Bible presents us to God, okay? It's more like this. God looks down and he says, that's pathetic. Okay, that's kind of the way God looks at it because, see, we're sinners and God is very clear on that. In fact, the Old Testament is very, very clear as to the way God sees sin and our participation in it, okay? We are distanced from God and so that's really the crux of it. So if, if God is loving us because he has affection for us, I don't think so, All right? If we're loving people because we have affection for them, mm, I, I don't think we're seeing it the way God wants us to see it. So let's kind of look at this uh, in a little different way. So let's look at Matthew 5.44. I'm going to see if this cultural definition fits here. This is what Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. I don't know about you, but I really don't feel a lot of affection for my enemies. When I know they're to be enemies, I don't have this overwhelming desire to run over and hug them. I don't have this overwhelming desire to be with them, to spend time with them, quality time. Uh, I have a tendency to want to not spend any time with them to not talk to them, not be with them. And certainly, there's the temptation to say, what goes around comes around, buddy. Okay? Or to say, God, why don't you deliver on this guy what he deserves? Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we probably are going to have a tendency to do if we try to apply our cultural definition of love to God's love, right? <clears throat> so, let's look at, at, at a verse that I find as a key to, first of all, redefining this concept of love, but also the idea of measuring love. Have you ever thought about that? We, like, see, when I, I, when I was thinking about this, I thought, this pulpit is a brand new pulpit. It's, it's a new one. Somebody from this church, a man in this church, built this. Now, if I had a tape measure, and I was tempted to, to bring it, but I could measure the length, the width, the height of this, and tell you just exactly what the dimensions are. Right now, I'd have to estimate it, and I'd probably be very wrong. But how do you measure love, right? It, now, if you ask the little guys, right, how much do you love God? I love this much, right? How much do you love your sister? Oh, maybe this one. <laughs> Brother? <laughs> right? So, but this isn't really an accurate way to measure love, right? So if I ask you, I say, well, how much do you love your enemy? Where does that fall on this little measurement that we have, right? That's not really an accurate way to measure it. We could even say this, well, how do you measure the love of God? Well, as a little kid, we might get this, but as an adult, we go, well, gosh, God is infinite, and he's magnificent. How do you measure this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a verse that I think will help us to redefine, but also to give us kind of a measuring tool. So here it is, 1 John 3, 17. And this really opened my eyes to some things on this. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Hmm. 
I kind of sense here that what God is saying is that if I see that you have a need, I have the resources to meet it, but I refuse to do it. The question is, am I really showing the love of God? Am I really loving? No, I'm not. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't have the love of God. I mean, I'm just, I'm not showing it. I'm like, yeah, God, lay it on me, but I'm not willing to give it. Not good, huh? So here's, here's what I'm going to do. Let's redefine love like this. Love is seeing the need of another and caring enough to meet it. Okay? We've just removed affection from it. That's what we've done. Okay? And I've, I've, I've shared with you why we would do that. So if we, if we remove affection from it, I'm not saying to you, affection and love don't go together. You remember the classic idea? I have to do it from this perspective because I'm kind of like in preference to this. Boy sees girl. All right? Boy is attracted to girl. Boy begins to have affection for girl, right? But that's the point when we say, I fell in love. But if you fell in love, why is it that two months later, you fell out of love. It's because here's what happened. You had affection, but it really never was love. It was just affection. And affection is based on feelings, and feelings come and go. Okay? So, point two. Loving God. Now let's see if we can take this definition, this new definition that we've made, and apply it to God. All right? So we're going to ask this question. If it's meeting the needs of others, what are the needs of God? That's not an O. <laughs> That's a zero. Now let me, let me get you up to snuff here. You, you may be thinking in your mind that God has a need. Maybe he needs my worship. Or maybe he needs my praise, or he needs my glory. Well, let me inform you that he doesn't need that. He doesn't need your worship, your praise, your glory, your attendance at church, your Bible reading, your witnessing. He doesn't need anything that you have or that I have. And the reason is because, first of all, he's already given all of that to us. Your worship is to meet your need. That's what it is. Your giving God glory is to meet your need. Every single thing that we do, Bible reading, attending church, going to a small group, whatever it is that you're doing, is to meet your need. Or it could be to meet somebody else's need, right? So how do we love God if he doesn't have any needs and the definition of love is meeting the needs of someone else? Well, let me share something with you here. There's two verses that, and it's just two, there's others, but this, these are two verses that will help us understand this. In John 14, 15, this is what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. The reason Jesus is saying this, and I'm not going to take the time to prove this, because I could take you all the way back to the garden and I could prove that this is true. Jesus is not saying this because it's a cute little thing to say and after all, we always know that God has commandments and we need to do those. He's saying this because it's the only way to love God. There is no other way to love God than to obey Him. That's the only way we can because God has no need. So, John 15, 10. Did Jesus follow his own rule? Yeah, he did. John 15, 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus knew the only way that he as a human being he, remember, he took on flesh. The only way he could love the Father in that condition was to obey the Father. 
And that's what he did. So he's not asking us to do anything that he did not do himself. Now this is where you might think, well then, Brother Croft, when you say keep his commandments, this is where we're going to go through this huge list of commandments, right? Now I think the Jews had, what, 613 laws or something like that, right? Okay, well let's, let's reduce it down a little bit, okay? So let's look at John 13, 34 and see what Jesus said his commandments are. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So what Jesus is doing in his response to the Pharisees is he's reducing the law down to the point of saying, I want you to love. That's my commandment. Okay? That's it. So here's what it is. How do I love God? I love God by loving others. That's how we do it. So, I'm not saying that you can't have affection for God. You can. I'm not saying that God doesn't have affection for you. He does. But what I am saying this, if you're going to express your love to God, it needs to be by loving others. Okay? And we know that loving others is meeting their needs. So that's how we do that. Now, let's go to point number three. Point number three. This is loving my neighbor. And this one is really, it's not difficult if we follow kind of a, a checklist. It's kind of hard emotionally, though. The other day, and I, I have a very needy neighbor, okay? And I, he's not the kind of guy that I would normally hang out with, okay? But... He's very needy, so it's not uncommon for him to knock on my door. And I have this great urge to go and hide when he does that. But I'm trying, so I'm trying to apply the definition and say, okay, Lord, he has a need, and I'm going to do everything I can to meet the need, so I'm going to answer the door. Well, it's like between 6.30 and 7 in the morning, okay? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying to do coffee and and stuff like this. And I thought I heard the knock, but I wasn't 100% sure. And I thought it was a really good time in the morning not to answer the door. (laughs) But I was certain that it was actually a knock on the door. And so I thought, well, I at least need to look out and see if it's actually him, right? And not some wandering cow. So... I look out, and there's a highway patrol car in the driveway. And I thought, well, I probably ought to answer the door. (laughs) So I did. I answered the door. He was already on his way back to the car. And I said, oh, I said, hey, uh, you know, what what can I do for you? And he said, oh, he said, uh, down the road, somebody uh, driving a truck went through the fence, and now there's cows all over the road, and do you know who owns the property? I said, no, but I tried to direct him to somebody that would. But the point being this is that I was really seriously thinking about not answering the door, okay? And, and so I am not any different than anybody else. Loving somebody else is not my cup of tea, not by nature, right? So I have to force myself. And so here's a few things that I have to do if I remember, and some things I can give to you. Number one, ask God to help you recognize the needs of others. And the reason is, is because most likely you're not going to have a ton of people run up and say, oh, brother, I have needs, okay? I, oh, I, you know, I need this, I need this. Most people are probably not going to do that because we have a tendency to want to be self-sufficient. We have a tendency to be proud, and we say, you know what? I just don't want to share all that with you, right? Okay, I'm okay, you're okay, let's just keep it there. But you know, sharing our needs with one another helps people to know what we need, and perhaps they have what we need, okay? So ask God to help you recognize the needs of others. Number two, make a conscious effort to observe what people need. In other words, when you see people or meet people or around people, See if you can notice maybe the little things that they need and maybe you can say, hey, you know what, I can do that for you. Or maybe do it without them even knowing. 
you know? So find some ways to do that. And this is a good way, by the way, to, to meet the needs of others that maybe don't even go to the church, uh, especially in your witnessing. Um, I don't know about you, but maybe you found this a little difficult. If you're going to go up to somebody and you're just going to lay the gospel on them, they're probably going to say, how about if you just go someplace else and I'll go someplace else, okay? There's a good chance they're going to say, you know, I'm really not interested. But, but what, if, what if you really are consciously making an effort to meet their need, right? And that would be, here, assess your ability to meet the need. Maybe you can't meet the need, and maybe you're going to have to go a little bit extra to find a way to meet that need. Or maybe you have to adjust your schedule or something like that, because I don't know, needy people have a tendency to take up our time, Right? So maybe you have to adjust your time. Number four, make an honest effort to meet their need. Okay, I'm not saying you're going to be able to meet their needs. Sometimes I have to tell my neighbor, you know what? No. No. Or sometimes I have to say, you know, can you give me like a day or two notice so I can plan for that? You know, so sometimes we have to say, you know, I'm going to meet that need, but I'm just not going to do it the way you want it done. So we, sometimes we have to help in that. So make an honest effort to meet their need. So, are we going to love our neighbor? That's it. So loving God is obeying God. The only way to love God is by loving my neighbor. Okay? And your enemy if you can. Right? Here's the application of this. I love God by seeing the needs of others and caring enough to meet them. Okay? Let me, let me close with this idea. <clears throat> if, if somebody came up to you and asked you, what is the greatest need that mankind has? What would your, what would your response be? Jesus yes, exactly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, a life. He said, I am it. And the bottom line is that the greatest need that you and I have as, as a, a human being is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because without it, we have no life. None. Oh yeah, we have existence and I'm moving and I'm doing my thing, but that's not life. So the only way to have it is in Jesus Christ and that's the greatest need we have. So you see, whatever need you're meeting for that neighbor, that enemy, or whatever, ultimately, you're trying to get to meeting their greatest need. Yeah? And that's the greatest need you have. It's the greatest need I have. And hopefully you've made that decision at some point. You said, you know what? I need him. And I want him. And I'm going to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope that in your attending here and in your interaction with us, you come to the point where you realize that need. So I want to thank you for listening and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to share with you today.